Republican North Texas Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you, Jack. It's good to be here. Good to be with you. And uh, this week, uh, former President Donald Trump, the presumed Republican presidential nominee, made headlines when he announced his position on abortion rights. He said that he felt those should be states' uh, positions, not federal. And I'm wondering if you agree with that. I, I, I have said for, for a long time that I believe it's the states as is constitutionally decided by the Supreme Court. It's the issue for the states to decide. You know, I know a lot of people want to jump in and say that the federal government should be taking this role, but they've got to think about, you know, bills that have gotten passed um, out of the House of Representatives when it was a Democrat majority. And I was on the floor of the House when all but one Democrat voted for an abortion um, up until the moment of birth at taxpayer expense. And I think those are very extreme uh, conditions. I think those are very extreme policies that the majority of Americans don't support. And I do believe, you know, again, as the Dobbs case has has uh, put an exclamation point behind, this is an issue for states to decide. How concerned are you about abortion rights being a motivating factor in the upcoming presidential election, specifically in the battleground states and also the potential impacts on the U.S. Senate race here in Texas? And I think, you know, everybody is going to have an issue that's important to them. What we're focused on is what is affecting the majority of Americans. When you look at inflation, it's nearly 20 percent over the last three and a half years. When you look at skyrocketing gas prices, when you look at what's happening in crimes throughout our country, crimes throughout our communities, you know, the increase by 10 to 11 million illegal immigrants in our country. And then you think about the deaths as a result of the fentanyl that's coming in illegally over our border. I think especially being a Texas representative and in our state, you're seeing the results of that every single day. And when I'm home and I'm talking and having uh, you know, roundtables, we're doing meet and greets, when we're out there you know, with, our, with the people that I represent, overwhelmingly, that's what they're talking about. I think we need to talk about abortion. I think we need to do it in a very caring manner, a very supportive manner. You know, I have actually in, in, uh, uh, introduced bills. You know, one of the bills that I've talked about is having the ability for a uh, adoptive parent to be able to put the birthing mother on their insurance for up to a year after the birth of the child. We need to provide uh, uh, supportive services for people who found women who find themselves in a position of having an unwanted pregnancy. I think talking about it in a sensitive manner as opposed to being divisive about it, I think will really help everybody. This week, you took out a full page ad in the New York Post encouraging law enforcement officers up in New York to, quote, escape New York and move to Texas. How did you come up with this idea? Uh, you know, why did you do it? And um, I would imagine that this was not tax dollars being used to pay for it. No, this was this was our campaign dollars that we used to pay for it. No taxpayer expense at all. But what we're doing is we're recruiting officers. We're recruiting people who put their their life on the line every single day. You know, when they go out, they don't know if they're going to be able to come home. And when I watched the horrific, you know, um, funeral of Jonathan Diller, and you know the politicians who basically went there for nothing more than a photo op. You know, these are the, the politicians that had installed great policies that were completely against the police officers, against the citizens and, and pro-criminals. Um, and those are the policies that to me led to a number of assaults on police officers in New York City every day. And I wanted to make sure that they understood they've got a home in Texas that where we revere, we respect, we appreciate the job that they do. We are growing. We're one of the fastest growing areas of the, of the country, fastest growing state in the country. We've got those job openings. And as you know, Jack, as you, you've covered, we have a job fair. You know, we're going to have another one August 8th. And we had a whole row of police departments and law enforcement agencies that were hiring last year. We've got the positions available. And we would love to have those folks that are in New York City right now who, again, you know, they cowboy up and they come and they, they protect the lives and, uh, and the rights of their citizens, but they're not being respected in New York. Come on down to Texas. You got a home here. And I know it's only been a several days, but have you received and have the 15 law enforcement agencies here in the DFW area that you had listed in your ad? Has there been any response? 
it's been one day. So I, you know, I've, I've been talking to some of the police chiefs and let, you know, let them know that I was putting this ad and they were all very happy that the response that I've gotten in, within the district from our law enforcement agencies has been tremendous. They're very supportive and they all agree that they are looking for good recruits. You know, there's a number of job openings right now and we need to be able to fill them. We need to be able to fill them with people who understand the job, who want to do the job and who want to be respected for obvious reasons. And um, we are excited that we're going to be able to recruit a bunch of officers. We are hopeful. And I think those are the kinds of, uh, you know, uh, practices that I like to do. It's thinking outside the box. How did you vote on the uh, FISA renewal bill? This would be allowing the U.S. to continue surveillance against foreign terrorists from launching attacks here in the United States and also would have added reforms uh, to protect Americans from getting caught up in all that. Well, we actually did not have a, a vote on the bill. Uh, what we did was we had a vote yesterday on the rule that would have allowed the bill to come to the floor. I voted for the rule because I wanted to be able to have a discussion debate on not only on the FISA bill, but also on the six amendments that they wanted to put with the FISA bill. You know, these reforms are necessary. We have seen how out of control uh, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies within the federal government have been. And this would definitely put restraints on them. For example, one of the one of the provisions, uh, one of the reforms is that you can char you can charge FBI officers with up to a 10 years in prison if they abuse this fight, this, these FISA warrants. You know, you need to have those kind of handcuffs on this type of, of, of policy. Um, we weren't able to vote on the bill because the rule didn't pass. Now, I don't know, look, moving forward, whether or not they're going to have that on suspension, which means that you can you can suspend the rules and bring it to the floor for a two thirds vote. I'm not sure if that's where Speaker Johnson is going to uh, is going to go. But I'm anxious to have a debate and hear the pros and cons of the reforms and, and let the American public know this is what we're doing. It's been years and decades since this program has been reformed. And we've seen what happens with the abuse. Why didn't it pass, do you think, at least to get to, you know, out of the Rules Committee? It got out of the Rules Committee, but when the rule came up for a vote on the floor, it did not pass. Any particular reason? I voted for the rule because I think when you're on the majority and you've got a, a rule that comes out of your majority-led uh, Rules Committee, you vote for that. It's procedural. Um, I would I would definitely, you know, talk to the, to the folks who didn't vote for it. Um, we've had a number of occasions that that has happened, three in the last year alone on you know, they, they all have their reasons. Uh, let's talk about border security. As you know, uh, Texas's immigration law, SB4, uh, controversial. It's been in the courts. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals is now considering it. How confident are you that Texas will ultimately win this, whether it's in the Fifth Circuit or the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, I would hope that Texas would win it. The federal government is not doing its constitutionally obligated job of being able to protect the state from invasion. And if that doesn't happen, then the, the state has a constitutionally project, uh, a protected right to actually be able to, to protect itself from invasion. And that's what we're seeing right now when the Biden administration policies have allowed 10 to 11 million people to enter our country illegally. You know, the, the vast majority of them from any other state are coming through Texas. 40% of the, of, the, uh, of the projected number have come through Texas. 60% of the Godwins have come to Texas. We're taking an unnecessary blunt of, of this irresponsible policy. And so Texas is stepping up. They're paying for it. They're, they're, they're putting their own you know, uh, law enforcement officers' lives on the line to be able to protect their citizens. And I would hope that the courts recognize that and would actually push the administration to do its job. We're trying to do that now. It's one of the reasons why I voted to impeach Secretary Mayorkas, is they are completely lying to Congress. It's about time, by the way, because just a few months ago, Mayorkas was saying that the border was secure, and now they're saying it's a disaster. Now that the president is threatening executive orders, which it was his executive orders that led us to the position that we're in now, but they're finally admitting that it is a disaster down there. But it's one of the reasons why I voted to impeach Mayorkas, is we're seeing this invasion happening at our border. We're seeing the threat to national security. And this administration is refusing to, to allow their agencies to do their job. Texas is stepping up, and I hope it gets the support of the courts. What's your thought about the fact that the U.S. Senate may not take up 
the impeachment trial of Mayorkas. Well, I haven't heard that they're not going to take it up, but I've heard that they're going to try to fast track it, but it's their constitutionally obligated job. And I keep saying that word and I don't say it lightly. I mean, we're up here as defined by those types of, of rights and responsibilities. And it's the responsibility of the Senate to take up the articles of impeachment to have a trial. And I would hope that they would take it seriously, considering the national security risks that not having uh, a secure border are causing. When you're seeing hundreds of people that are coming over from the terrorist watch list, when you're seeing thousands of military age single men coming over from the CCP, we don't know why they're here. We don't know if they want to do us harm. We do know, however, that we don't know who they are. We don't know where they're going. We don't know how long they're going to stay. We don't know what ultimately they're going to do. And that is a problem. And I would hope, again, that uh, the, the Senate you know, the senators who are representing those states that are most likely to be affected by this, which is, by the way, when we say every state is a border state, we mean it. Um, we had uh, uh, one of our Congress members on, uh, from the, nor the, the, the northernmost uh, portion say, yeah, we're seeing fentanyl, we're seeing crime activity, we're seeing sex trafficking and gang-related uh, violence in our communities. And we're about as far away from the border as you can get. Yeah, I would hope that those senators would take it seriously and do their job. Wanted to ask you about Ukraine aid. Do you support a bill? Would you support a bill to send aid to Ukraine to help them in their? Yeah, um, and, and again, I don't. I, I'm not. I'm not in favor of sending a blank check. I think we need to make sure that what that money is being spent on is for lethal aid. I think we need to make sure that you know if there's a way to get, you know possibly pay back, maybe not in cash, but it's a lend and a lease program as opposed to just writing a blank check. That that's considered. We don't want Russia to feel empowered, and that's what they, they feel right now when, when Ukraine is not getting support. But at the same token, what we've been talking about this morning is our border. And I want to make sure that we're prioritizing not just protecting Ukraine's border, but protecting our own border. And that has got to go hand in hand on with, with any kind of decision moving forward. That's the priority that I'm looking at right now. Do you agree with calls by some who want an immediate ceasefire in the Israel-Hamas war? Absolutely not. I, I think we have Americans right now who are being held hostage. You've got over almost 100 hostages that, that uh, are still being held in Gaza. They need to be released. That needs to be the first thing that you ask before you even discuss a ceasefire. And, and to, to call for a ceasefire when those hostages are still being held um, is ridiculous. We had updates yesterday from the freshman class that went to um, Israel uh, over, the, over the, uh, the, the recess last week. And they're saying that uh, almost half of the women who have been taken and I have only been raped, but have now been impregnated. We're ignoring that. We're ignoring that uh, that crisis. And, you know, if, if you want to see Sparta, let's go ahead and get those, those hostages back home. Let's not forget about them. How concerned are you about a wider war in the Middle East? Well, I think under weak leadership in the White House, it's exactly the threat that we face. And we're seeing it not just in the Middle East. We're seeing it in China. We're seeing it in Taiwan. We're seeing it in Ukraine. You know, it hasn't happened yet in, in, in uh, North Korea, but it's a possibility. And, and those are threats that didn't exist four years ago, which is you know, why I'm hopeful that we're going to have a change in the leadership in the White House in November. Um, and we need to get back to having a strong leader that people actually listen to. And my last question, too, and I appreciate your time, and that is the U.S. House Republicans seem there seems to be some division there. Do you support Speaker Johnson? Do you think he'll survive? Look, I feel I feel that he's in a rough place at a, at a horrible time. We've got a one member majority, which means that at any point in time, it just takes one member to be able to vote against you know any of the bills that are coming out of the majority uh, led House. Um, Speaker Johnson is, is an honest man. He is doing the best he can. He is working with transparency. He is telling us you know, the, the predicament that he's in. But he is only as strong as the conference stays together. And at this point in time, we can't lose one vote. So, you know, he's in a very precarious situation. You know, I think he's a good man. I think he's doing what he can. Um, I think he just needs a lot more support. He needs, he needs to be able to have um, the votes that the Republicans are, are holding strong to be able to pass, which means being able to pass rules. Republican North Texas Congresswoman Beth Van Dyne, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. You have a great week.